As a teenager, Hunter Thompson was an avid reader of whatever he could get his hands on, but especially novels. His favourite novelists included F. Scott Fitzgerald, Charles Dickens and Ernest Hemingway. In his early adulthood, he'd progressed from simply reading the work of his favourite writers to physically typing it out on his own typewriter. Now, the reason for him doing this wasn't so he could plagiarise anyone's work or pass anyone's work off as his own. It was so he could feel the rhythms and the beats of what it took to produce great writing. He felt like in order to be a great writer himself, he had to physically feel what it was like to type something brilliant, you know? And I think that that afforded him the confidence and the freedom to kind of express himself in his own style and, and create his own form of writing, which ended up being a form of writing that would take the 20th century by storm. And with every decade, even in the 21st century, with every decade that passes, Hunter S. Thompson almost becomes more and more iconic. So when I'm reading about someone I admire or watching a documentary or a YouTube video, I don't like it when they focus too much on the childhood because I know psychologists would be furious with me for that because our adult decisions are based on our childhood and all that. But the, the interesting thing about Hunter Thompson's life is his adulthood. So I'll give you a real, real brief overview of his childhood just so you know the kind of guy he is. So he's born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, born in 1937. And in a way, his childhood is kind of like a Bruce Springsteen song. Like he's, he's bored of the town he's in, he wants an adventure, he wants to kind of spread his wings. He's pretty dead set on the fact that he wants to be a writer from a very early age. And he's so kind of He's got such fire inside of him. He kind of becomes a little bit of a juvenile delinquent. Nothing really heavy, just sort of minor vandalism and, and this, that and the other. So he has a rebellious streak from a young age, which progresses and, and snowballs throughout his life, this rebellious streak of him. That's basically where we are when Hunter S. Thompson turns 18. Now his plan was that, you know, he's going to strike out on his own when he turns 18. But however, when he is 18, the year is 1955 which means that every, every male who isn't medically exempt for some reason has to do his mandatory military service, much like my granddad would have had to do in this country. So he begrudgingly completes his national service or his military service, whatever you want to call it, um, at the age of 20, and he's got that done, and now he's like, right, finally, I can go out into the world and do what I've been wanting to do since I was like 15 or something like that. So, where does he go? He decides the best place to start his journalistic career is New York City and he heads straight there. He worked briefly for Time magazine as a copy boy before being fired for quote insubordination. So the mind boggles is what that means but that's a brilliant, just, a, just one word as a reason to why he was fired, insubordination. Brilliant. It's perfect when you think of, of Hunter S. Thompson. I like to imagine what that was for. I couldn't really get much details in it. But yeah, so he's fired from Time magazine for insubordination. He was also fired from another New York-based newspaper called the Middletown Daily Record. You might be thinking I meant to say the Midtown Daily Record. I didn't. It says online it's the Middletown Daily Record, so I'm just going to go with that. So he gets fired from the Middletown Daily Record. Now the reason they've put down for his being fired from this job is that he broke a candy machine allegedly and also um, got in a verbal dispute, a verbal confrontation with one of the newspaper's biggest financial donors. So probably not the, not the best start for Hunter in New York, but also he's having an adventure. So he's living life, he's out there, he's doing what he does, he's being a rebel, he's doing a bit of writing, picking up a bit of work here and there. We've got the adventure rolling now. So in 1960, Hunter Thompson decides he's had enough of the Big Apple and he wants a little bit of a warmer climate, a bit of sand, a bit of something new, palm trees maybe. He lands a job working for a sports magazine by the name of El Sportivo based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. While he was living in San Juan, he wrote his first two novels, Prince Jellyfish and my personal favourite book of all time, The Rum Diary, which criminally wasn't published until 1998. From 1960 to 1963, Thompson worked tirelessly as a Caribbean slash South American correspondent for multiple American-based newspapers. He also works for a brief period of time in Brazil for the only English language newspaper available in Rio de Janeiro. So in 1964, we see him write his third book, which is probably one of the most insane pieces of embedded journalism at that point that had ever, that had ever been written. He lands a job writing a fly-on-the-wall book about what life was like riding with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. No journalist has ever been granted uh, up until this point in history. I'm not sure if they have since then, 
But up until this point, at least, no journalist had ever been granted the the amount of inside access that he was allowed. Now they're they're very they're very careful that they don't call it a gang. It's apparently a club. So we're to say that that the Hell's Angels are not a gang. They're a motorcycle club. But Hunter S. Thompson was was allowed to ride with the Hell's Angels as if he was almost one of them, so he could write this book. They weren't too happy, however, with the the final result of his book, and, and this guy had something to say about it. It was Thompson who lived, drank, and rode with the Hells Angels and wrote about them in a bestseller. He was the first to compare them to the outlaws of the West. The critics have been unanimous in their praise of his book. I know exactly what I said. I spent uh, two years in the den. Well, I, I'd like to then get to the get to the end of it then on, on why... Well, let's, 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 I, let's people let's after, the, after you spent a year with us, there, right? you spent a year with us, why you got your head thumped on. All right, get to it. All right, I want to know why we didn't get the two kegs of beer that you promised us. <laughs> hey, you got into a man's personal argument. That's a not right lie. No, no, I it ain't. This afternoon, and oh, go ahead and tell it. All right, this, is, this is my side of what happened. Okay, you weren't there, so why don't you preface it with that? This is what this is what happened. Okay, and you, and you see if this isn't right. Junkie George was beating his old lady. Junkie George. <laughs> Junkie George? Junkie George. <laughs> Do you say so? Well, this is what happened. I'm serious. <laughs> Junkie George was beating his old lady. I remember Junkie that. George, right. Junkie right. George's dog, I can, well, listen to this. Junkie George's dog bit him, right? <laughs> I to me, this that. is a personal fan. This is I a didn't personal feud. If a guy wants to beat his wife and his dog bites him, that's between the three of them, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right. So after the Hells Angels book release, he's he's given an assignment to write a piece on the on the emerging hippie culture in Big Sur, California. He gets so embedded with this uh, with this spirit of of the '60s and what's coming out of the '60s in the sense of social change and, and political revolution and and rights for for minorities whether that be due to the the color of your skin or your sexual orientation you know there was there was a big movement in in the mid to late 1960s where young people were kind of like fuck it it doesn't matter if you're gay fuck it it doesn't matter who cares if you're black or if you're if you're from another country or this that and the other we're all human beings summer of love flower power it's all kicking off in the 60s and hunter is well on board to be a part of it so his passion for this kind of lifestyle and this kind of social change, uh, mixed with his nose for where a good story was, led him to San Francisco, California, which at the time was pretty much the epicentre of the world for social change and social revolution. He fell in love with the spirit of San Francisco in that time and the, there was something in the air, there was something being created uh, by just a sheer force of will of, of, a, of a gathering of people, of a community of people. Uh, that he kind of carries that with him, you know, it's kind of like he laments that for the rest of his life. You know, he wanted to really hang on to that, but he just felt it slipping through his fingers. And as the 60s rolled into the 70s, he felt like that that spirit of, you know, that, that, that really ballsy spirit of we're, we're changing something, we're a part of something. He felt like by the 70s that had kind of faded away and he, he didn't think it was present in San Francisco anymore, that's for sure. So if he wanted to ever forge that atmosphere again and to create that vibe, he would have to find a way to do it himself. This led him to Colorado where he purchases a plot of land with a cabin in a place called Woody Creek near Aspen. Hunter's property became known as Owl Farm and Creative people, writers, actors, politicians sometimes would, would, would come and gather seeking conversational stimulation and they would talk to the one and only Hunter S. Thompson to set the world to rights. One of the benefits to having so much land and privacy was that Hunter could have all the fun he wanted. He could blow things up, he could play a game called Shotgun Golf, which he invented, which John Cusack explains as basically you would, one guy would have a shotgun and just be, and just be waiting like that. And then the other guy would tee off and the guy with the shotgun would just have to blast the, the golf ball out of the sky. And then that was uh, that meant you won. So so that was shotgun golf. He loved riding his motorbike through the through the landscape of Colorado and just sort of weaving in and out of the roads and, and late at night and feeling feeling the wind. I was going to say in his hair, but by that time he kind of started to lose his hair. So basically just the wind 
on his face and head, basically. His feelings for the place could best be described maybe in this, in this little passage that he wrote that's narrated by a friend of his. Have a look at this. In 1970, Hunter felt like there was enough of a culture in Aspen, Colorado of sort of young people who were a bit more liberal and, you know, like to smoke a bit of weed and do a bit of mushrooms, but they weren't harming anyone. You know, they, they kind of liked to, they were a new breed. This hasn't been seen before. This hadn't been seen in the 50s or the 40s or anything like that. This long hair, uh, pot smoking, country music, folk, like Bob Dylan, they listened to Bob Dylan and this was kind of blowing the minds of of the old sort of crusty republicans and they didn't like that they didn't like these young liberals invading their town and making it all you know free basically they didn't they didn't like that so so hunter thompson decides at this point that he wants to maybe get into politics himself he announces his candidacy in 1970 for the sheriff of aspen he wants to run against the sitting sheriff, a guy by the name of Carol D. Whitmore. Um, that is a man. I don't know why his parents decided to name him Carol, but that's fine. If they, that's, that's fine, each to his own, or hers. If your hair was long and your tobacco was green, the, the Republicans wanted you gone, much like today. In fact, in a, in a bid to, to counter this, this uh, aversion to, to anyone with long hair, Hunter Thompson ended up shaving his head completely so he could then refer to Whitmore as his long-haired opponent, which I thought was quite a nice touch. So, what were Hunter's policies, you might be asking yourself? I'm glad you asked. His policies were, he didn't want any skyscrapers to be built, or, or tall buildings, shall we say, because of the, the gorgeous mountainous views that surrounded the city. So, naturally, you want to be able to see those views. So, he wanted to, to place a law where buildings couldn't be built above a certain height, which makes sense. One of the other things he wanted to do was to decriminalise drugs, obviously. And last but not least, he wanted to change the name of Aspen to Fat City. Now, on paper, terrible idea. But the reason for that was he didn't want investors to, to be attracted to Aspen and then come in and just bulldoze everything and change the whole city and change the spirit of the whole city. So so that's why he, he, he wanted to change its name to Fat City so people would be like, oh, we'll just, we'll just go somewhere else and ruin it. I'm on board at this point. I'm on board. However, after a hard-fought campaign, Thompson would end up conceding to Whitmore, having only garnered 44% of the county votes of Colorado. Now, what's annoying about this is, is Thompson actually won the popular vote in Aspen, but because he only got 44% of the county-wide vote, he ended up losing the election. But never fear, this is a blessing in disguise for Hunter S. Thompson. Now, Everyone wants, not everyone in the town because he didn't get elected, but a lot of people in the town were just absolutely gutted that he didn't win the election because he was so close. He really was so close. But had he have won that election, he never would have written the most iconic novel of his career, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. After his loss to Carol D. Whitmore in Aspen, he was hired by Sports Illustrated magazine to cover a, a race called the Mint 400, which was a motorcycle race that took place in the Nevada desert. He was accompanied by his partner in crime, his attorney, ironically enough, and uh, an, a novelist in his own right, a guy by the name of Oscar Zeta Acosta, who in the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was played by Benicio Del Toro. The pair decided that they wanted to go in search for something that had never really clearly been defined. They wanted to go and see if they could find the American dream. What they found instead was a drug fueled adventure into the heart of Las Vegas, which was a changing Las Vegas at that time. See, in the 1960s, you had like, especially the early 60s, you had Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., suits and ties. It was mainly the people Las Vegas attracted were kind of, you know, people who were in their 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe, who had a little bit of money. They, they were a bit older, they had a bit more disposable income. So Las Vegas at that point was controlled by the mafia, which ironically made it safer than it's ever been before. Um, if anyone was causing trouble in Las Vegas, that was bad for business and the mob kind of just quickly nipped that in the bud. I won't go into it any more than that. Las Vegas was, was kind of morphing from that Frank Sinatra suit and tie Rat Pack Las Vegas. It was morphing into a more neon riddled carnival of excess, if you want. And excess was certainly something that was present. The narration from this that I'm going to play is taken from the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Have a listen to Johnny Depp, who plays uh, Hunter S. Thompson's kind of loose character in this, uh, describing the contents of the, of the trunk of their car. Have a listen to this. We had two bags of grass, 
75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, a salt shaker half full of cocaine, a whole galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, laughers, also a quarter tequila, quarter rum, case of beer, pint of raw ether, and two dozen amyls. Not that we needed all that for the trip, but once you get locked into a serious drug collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. Although the pair's drug collection was probably exaggerated a little bit for, you know, a literary effect, it probably also wasn't too far from the truth. The psychedelic and the semi-autobiographical nature of, of the writing process, in my opinion, makes Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas one of the most pioneering novels of all time. Join me in part two, where I'll be discussing what kind of a career boost Thompson had upon the release of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, how it turned him into a sort of cartoonish cultural icon of rebellion, and how, how it affected the rest of his life, really. It propelled him to fame on an international level, and suddenly he kind of had these expectations to fill, these shoes to fill, that he had never really had before. He, he was kind of bouncing around you know, in the first half of his career, doing a bit of this, a bit of that, and it was really interesting. But he hadn't embedded himself into the zeitgeist of society yet. That was that was to happen in the decades following Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which arguably they're the most interesting times of Hunter's life is, is the last half of it. Obviously, that's completely up for debate, but it's certainly just as exciting as the first half. While you're here, uh, hit the subscribe button if you like the way I tell stories, if you like the way I talk about people from history, then hit that subscribe button. I'll be doing lots of videos like this on, on cultural icons from all walks of life, music, film, politics. Anyway, all that said, look forward to seeing you on part two of Hunter S. Thompson Intellectual Hellraiser.